um, to this month's for Thursday's Lunch and Learn webinar series. Thanks for listening in. Um, this month's presenter is Tommy Thompson, who is the Executive Vice President of CanCare, Inc., which is a great nonprofit here in Houston uh, that has a network of trained volunteers that matches up, uh, people who have gone through treat cancer treatment with others who are going through the same, um, same experiences. So thank you so much to Tommy. So we'll go ahead and get started without any further ado. Okay. And I think that we're ready to go here. Are we set up to go? Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, that's the wrong All right, we're working on the. <laughs> Click. All right, yeah. here we go. Well, I'm glad to be here, and I'm going to run through these slides, and then we'll have some time to feedback. But also, as I go through, I'm going to be asking you to do some reflecting, um, and that way we can um, maybe have some discussion at the end. Um, this program that I'm doing is one that I did for a group of oncology nurses back in March. And uh, I think that was what uh, became the idea. I know Amy Deutsch and a few others were at that meeting. And so this was geared to nurses and, and professional caregivers. Uh, but I know that we all have caregiving roles, and so I think it'll be applicable. But one of the things that I did, uh, Medscape Journal did a survey of some nurses and nurse practitioners uh, looking at their role as a professional caregiver, what they liked best about it, and what they were most distressed about. And uh, this first slide is simply a response, a record of some of the responses. Most caregivers, professional caregivers especially, love making a difference. And they love being in a profession where they can see that they're making a difference. And that was very telling, I think, uh, because that's, that's really what motivates us as caregivers, is to know that we're doing something that's making a difference. Continuous learning, regular employment, acceptable salary uh, for a lot of folks, team interactions, et cetera, were some of the popular responses, and you can see those there. But when, when they were asked what was most distressing, uh, the top two were patient load and lack of respect. And not just lack of respect uh, from patients, but from other healthcare professionals as well. And so there were some things that were telling there, I thought, that, you know, we all want to be appreciated for what we do, but sometimes uh, we have to work through the fact that not everyone sees the value of what we're doing, and that can some, sometimes be very stressful. Um, demands of patients and families, uh, issues with management, inadequate salary for some, poor teamwork. Teamwork was one of the most popular things that in terms, when it works well, it's, it's an asset. When it doesn't work well, it becomes a real liability. Uh, and, of course, going down some long hours and, and that kind of thing. So when I was doing working with the nurses, we started looking at, first of all, that we all experience life in four dimensions or four domains. Um, and those are the physical, the emotional, the cognitive, and the spiritual. When you think about it, all of us experience life like this. We have things that we experience physically. Uh, particularly when we're dealing with cancer and cancer-related issues, of course, the symptoms and the treatment, the side effects, all the decisions the, are, are the appointments that have to be kept, uh, the logistics of just dealing with the disease, and, and et cetera. And then, of course, the cognitive, the thoughts, the meaning, the perceptions, um, analysis, uh, and then making those choices, those are all things. And a lot of people, when they're experiencing cancer as a patient or a caregiver, experience it physically and cognitively while they're going through treatment. And it's oftentimes after treatment's over and they're kind of looking back at where they were that the emotions really come out strong. Can you oh, sorry. Mute your phone, please. And then the emotional, uh, of course, the feelings, reactions, um, and the spiritual. And, and spiritual, when I think of spiritual, I don't just mean religious, but I think of the whole sense of the meaning of life and things like death, suffering, uh, the sense of future. I have yet to meet someone who planned on having cancer as part of their future, so the future that we create for our life often dies. Um, but that's also true as, as a professional caregiver sometimes. We don't anticipate or plan for the things that happen, and uh, we have to rework our future sometimes. And of course, hope is very much a spiritual uh, part of the human experience. Here's the definitions of the domains that I've used, uh, and you can see those domain in which physical is 
the domain of the tangible forms and structures, emotional domain of qualitative feelings. Um, the mental and cognitive domain is the domain of thoughts and judgments, assumptions and beliefs. Um, actually, my sister was just diagnosed with cancer this week, and uh, we were dealing with the whole reality of what it means to have cancer. Uh, and we lost a relative this summer with the same type of cancer that she's been diagnosed with. So she had to deal with the uh, assumptions, her assumptions about what's going to happen. And then the spiritual, the domain of meaning, purpose, and this the connectedness to the whole of life. And we're going to look at that more in just a minute. That's how we experience life as an individual, but the reality is, is we don't live in isolation. Uh, we have families that experience the same kinds of things with us, uh, whether it's as a professional and we're being overworked or frustrated at work and we take that home with us or whatever. Uh, the impact that it has on our friendships, um, our jobs, you know, certainly are become a source of, uh, of um either support or they can be a source of, of struggle for us when we're diagnosed with cancer. And then, of course, as, an, as a professional caregiver, that's where we interact with most of our uh, patients and care receivers. And then the community as a whole. Um, and how all of this functions together really is what makes life. You know, it's not just one of these. Uh, it's how they all work together in all four do domains as well. Uh, I call this the 21 dimensions of the human experience, and uh, the 21st is how it all works together, or not, <laughs> as the case may be. So when I think of caregivers, what are some of the challenges that you as a caregiver might have, whether you're a professional caregiver or a family caregiver? Uh, think about that for a moment, maybe jot some down. I'm going to offer some suggestions. Um, but what is one of the challenge what are some of the challenges that you as a caregiver face that impact the way you uh, experience your life as a caregiver? I know that uh, one is emotional attachment. I was working with a group of nurses in Atlanta recently, and one of the nurses that I was working with was a floor supervisor broke down in tears and was talking about the fact that their cancer center, their cancer unit is very new and they're all trying to learn how to work with patients. And when they lose a patient, it really impacts them emotionally. And uh, they really feel the stress of that and uh, the sense of loss there. And we talked about the fact that often that has to do with a sense of attachment and as professional caregivers, one of the challenges we have is managing and balancing our our level of compassion. We don't want to be insensitive and we don't want to be harsh, but at the same time we have to avoid becoming too attached so that we have enough distance to be appropriate in our uh, care for our care receivers. Coping with the emotions of the patient and care receiver can often be a problem. I was working with a group of nurses who were just ready to open their first uh, cancer unit in a hospital and I asked them, what are they most afraid of? And that, this was the number one response uh, from the nurses on that particular unit, is they were afraid of how to handle the emotions of the patient and their families. Feeling overwhelmed, uh, I think all of us can relate to that in life, especially these days. Long hours, uh, you know, for a family caregiver, your hours are endless. But for professional caregivers, oftentimes we're on call as well as have very long hours uh, that we work during the week. And when we're working, uh, those hours are filled with a lot of pressure, stress, and demands. There it is, stress. I, I'm, I don't think anyone has ever experienced stress, right? Uh, it's one of the most common human challenges that we have. And then avoiding burnout, and burnout being, uh, you know, true emotional and physical exhaustion to the point that I cannot function anymore. And then anger and frustration keep coming up quite a bit. You know, when we have more than we feel like we can handle, um, a lot of times we get frustrated and our frustration often turns to anger. And guilt. Uh, particularly for caregivers, whether we're professional caregivers or we're family caregivers, uh, we love to fix things. And when we can't fix them, we often feel guilty. 
uh, and we'll talk more about that, but I, I think it's really important to understand that that's a big part of being a caregiver, uh, something that we often feel. This, is for, this slide is from a program called Powerful Tools for Caregivers. It's a program that's done uh, that really supports people who are in the care, family caregiving role. And one of the things that we look at in our sessions is the fact that anger and hurt often have as their root pain and fear. Um, sometimes if I'm working with a patient and they're angry with me, it might be because simply they're in pain. Um, but it could be emotional pain as well, or it could be fear of what's happening or what they can't control, etc. Uh, and the reality is that if we don't deal or name our emotions, oftentimes they erupt in inappropriate ways, whether it's um, yelling or uh, cursing at someone that we work with or a family member. Uh, oftentimes we take our frustrations out on the people that we love. I think uh, everyone can relate to that. Sometimes we have physical uh, expressions of our suppressed emotions like stomach ache uh, or emotional. We get depressed um, or we try to self-medicate with alcohol or other, other substances. So these are all things that we have to be aware of and recognize that it's very important for those of us in the caregiving role, whether family or professional, to take good care of ourselves. And that's what this program is really all about. Truth, the truth is that feelings are a normal response to a situation. We have feelings in every situation. Whether we own them or not, it's up to us. But they are a, very much a normal response. They are changeable. And that's something I think that we all need to remember is our feelings are changeable. They're often an outgrowth of our perspective. And uh, they're a wonderful tool for self-understanding. And in order to do that, the first thing I have to do is identify my feelings. I like to use, the, I like to say we have to name our feelings. And uh, I don't know if um, you're religious or not, but in the Jewish Christian tradition, to name something actually means to have power over it. And that's true with our emotions, that when we're able to name our emotions, we actually have power over them. They don't have power over us. We have to accept them and own them as our feelings, not judge whether they're right or wrong, they just are, and then to learn from those feelings. What is it that's at the root of that feeling? Have I been hurt or uh, am, I, have I, uh, am I afraid of something? Is something threatening me? That kind of thing. I love this uh, quote from Jack Kornfield. He said, when we come into the present, we begin to feel the life around us again. We also encounter whatever we have been avoiding. What We must have the courage, he said, to face whatever is present, our pain, our desires, our grief, our loss, our secret hopes, our love, everything that moves us deeply. <sighs> behind also a lot of what's behind our emo emotions are sense, is a sense of loss. And as caregivers, uh, whether professional caregivers or family caregivers, uh, we often experience losses. I know uh, as a family caregiver, uh, as I've worked with some of my own family members, one of the things that's changed and that I feel that we've lost is our relationship. Sometimes it's our sense of intimacy with each other. Uh, sometimes it's our ability to have the kinds uh, do the kinds of things that we used to do, uh, whether they be fun or, or meaningful traditions or whatever, that oftentimes uh, when we're as a caregiver, uh, we have senses have a sense of loss. As professional caregivers, I talked earlier about the nurse uh, who was grieving over the loss of some of her patients. Um, that's very true. I did a program recently for a group of physicians, a CME lecture, and I asked them, do physicians grieve? And uh, the reality is all of us grieve every loss. Grief is not an option when we experience loss. So it's important to take note of the losses that we experience. So take a moment and think about your own life and your own experience. What are some of the losses that you have experienced in your role either as a professional or a family caregiver? I love this quote from Ann Morrow Lindbergh who said, I don't believe that sheer suffering teaches. 
If suffering alone taught, all the world would be wise since everyone suffers. She says, to suffering must be added mourning, understanding, patience, love, openness, and I love this last part, and the willingness to remain vulnerable. When we as caregivers avoid being vulnerable, we can't be the compassionate people that we need to be in our roles. So it's having that sense of balance, it's being aware of our losses, our emotions, our challenges, and naming those and being appropriate with them. That becomes very important. So let's think about loss. And when I think about loss, I know a lot of people think about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who said we have uh, some stages that we go through when we grieve. She said denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. But actually what she's describing is the grief response, the inward response to loss. But when we're grieving, there's also work that has to be done. And the work of grieving is referred to as mourning. Mourning and grief are not the same thing. And it's important to distinguish between the two. And also, a lot of what we're doing is we're working or transitioning from something that we were used to having around to something to a new reality that doesn't have that there anymore. So the work of transition is often the work of grief. And there was a British psychologist who worked with another psychologist. Uh, his name is John Bowlby, and he worked with a guy named Parts. And they came up with what they, de they describe as four phases of mourning. And there's American, an American thanatology professor, uh, William Warden, who said, there are four tasks of mourning. And I put these side by, by side because I think they make a lot of sense when we, when we look at them together. Bowlby said the first phase of mourning is shock and numbness. Uh, I know that I've experienced that this week. You know, when the, yesterday when the surgeon came out to tell us the news about my sister, we didn't feel anything, you know, and uh, I know that when she hears the results, she's not going to feel anything. So what is the task that goes with that? It is to accept the reality of the loss, to accept the reality of what is happening, uh, to name it, to give it a name. The second phase is yearning and searching, and uh, I love the way that this uh, kind of functions in our life. A lot of us, when we have a lot of change that happens or when we have a loss that happens, the one thing that we want to do is have everything return to what? Normal, right? Only that old normal isn't relevant anymore. And so we have to allow that normal to go as well. And in order to do that, we have to choose to feel the pain of what it is that, we have, that we're grieving. We have to choose to allow our grief to be a part of our lives. Um, when I was a kid, I used to pass out when I got shots. And uh, I told this to this group of nurses, and of course, they all just laughed. Uh, but I, my sister is a CRNA and uh, is a nurse anesthetist, and she used to pass out when she got shots, too. So I don't feel so bad anymore. Um, but I finally decided that, you know, the reason I passed out was when I saw a needle coming, I would tense up every muscle in my body and it would make the shot hurt a lot worse. And I finally figured out, and I'm not telling you how old, how old I was when I figured this out, but I finally figured out that if I could just relax, then it didn't hurt quite as bad. Uh, the old English have a word for that, and it is suffer. In the old English, the word suffer means to allow it to happen or allow it to be. And sometimes, we have to just allow the things that are happening in our lives to be. And doing that can be sometimes a difficult task, but it's one that we have to accomplish. Of course, uh, when we do that, then we're left with uncertainties, right? And we're disoriented. We don't know what to expect next. And so we have to learn to take life, what? One day at a time. Uh, and in order to do that, we have to adjust to life with this new reality. And we have to be patient with ourselves when we're doing this uh, because it's, it's a day-to-day -day experience. Um, 
the definition of the word coping by Lazarus and Folk is constantly changing efforts to effectively manage stressful demands. And basically what that means is what works today may not work tomorrow, and what works tomorrow may not work the next day. So every day I just have to learn to cope with today until I get a sense of new balance with this new reality that I'm living with. And then I feel a sense of reorientation. I feel rejuvenated. I have new energies to invest in new endeavors. Um, and it's a journey. And this, this is a journey that we make with every loss that we experience in life. Some, and it depends on how attached we are. And this is one of the things that Bowlby and Parks worked with. And Bowlby had a theory of attachment, that we grieve the things that we're most attached to. We grieve harder the things that we're most attached to. So that goes back to the reality that as family caregivers, we grieve quite a bit because we're very attached to the people that we love. As professional caregivers, we have to maintain that balance between attachment and compassion. Walter Anderson said, although I may not be able to prevent the worst from happening, I am responsible for my attitude toward the inevitable misfortunes that darken life. Bad things do happen. How I respond to them defines my character and the quality of my life. I can choose to sit in perpetual sadness, he said, immobilized by the gravity of my loss, or I can choose to rise from the pain and treasure the most precious gift I have, life itself. I think that is such a powerful uh, statement. I showed that recently at one of our can care trainings, and uh, it really the participants really resonated with that, having been through the cancer experience, about how important it is uh, to work on our attitude. So let's think a minute about stress, because all of this becomes very stressful. Dealing with the challenges, dealing with loss becomes very stressful. Uh, and in Powerful Tools for Caregivers, we teach this model for managing stress, and it's very simple, and I hope it's helpful for you. Four steps. First, recognize your warning signs early. Second, identify what stresses you out. What is your source of stress? Third, identify what you can and cannot change. I wonder how many of us would agree that sometimes we're the most stressed out because we're trying to change things that deep down inside we really know we can't change. And then finally, take action to reduce your stress. So let's think first about the first two, and I'm going to invite you to respond to these on your own, but I'll share mine with you. Uh, warning signs of stress. What are your warning signs of stress? How do you know that you're stressed. I know I'm stressed because my ears turn red and get really hot. And I also tend to grind my teeth at night. And so I wake up with an earache in the morning. So those are a couple of signs that tell me I am stressed. Uh, your eyes, start eyes start twitching. twitching uh, and sometimes it's um, also um, behavioral, like I'll become irritable. Of course, no one else is that right? No. So what are your signs of stress? Think about that for yourself. And then second, what is the source of stress? Construction in Houston traffic. <laughs> <laughs> um, or it could be uh, patients that don't cooperate. Uh, or a family member that keeps telling you what to do. Oh, look at the Evelyn and Jordan say, Evelyn can't sleep and Jordan eats. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Uh, but it's important to know what stresses you out as well, so you, and to know your warning signs and then what stresses you out as well. And then what happens if we neglect stress? Your face breaks out. <laughs> Increased health problems, acne. <laughs> Disrupted relationships. Um, especially if you tend to have behavioral expressions of stress, right? Burnout, which again is the total physical and emotional exhaustion. Depression. And decreased, decreased quality of care, whether I'm a professional caregiver or a family caregiver. Um, when I'm under stress, I'm not going to be at my best. Focus. 
focusing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. You know, I'm amazed at how many people I talk to today that feel overwhelmed uh, with life right now. And I think the stress level in our communities is extremely high. And I've, I've experienced that myself. Just drive around Houston. Just drive around Houston. Exactly. And watch how many people get mad at you in traffic. <laughs> I love this serenity prayer from Reinhold Niebuhr. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, I think that is so important uh, to identify what we can change and know what we can't change and to focus on the things that we know we can change. So what are some of the things that I can change? I can change a situation. If something isn't working out for me, I can make the situation so more workable. For instance, if I'm caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's, and my loved one keeps turning the stove on and leaving it on. I can take the knobs off the stone, uh, off the stove, but I can't stop my care receiver from turning the stove on. So I have to be aware of what I can and can't change. I can't change my care receiver, but I can change the situation. Uh, or I can change my perception if a patient snaps at me because I'm having to do something that has to be done I can change, I can perceive that as them being ugly and mean, or I can change my perception and recognize that they're dealing with a life threatening situation and they're afraid. So, my perception and how I approach them it becomes very important. Uh, it's not about me, it's just simply where they are with their situation. Uh, I can change, therefore, my response. Um, I can respond by reacting or I can choose to be more patient in my response. And finally, I can change my attitude. Um, we've all had times in life when our attitudes have been poor. And when we have a poor attitude, oftentimes it results uh, in us doing things that we normally wouldn't do. So being aware of our attitude and being able to change our attitude and recognizing that that is something we can change is very important. Uh, my favorite example of that is paying taxes. I don't know of anybody that likes paying taxes, but we can choose to have an attitude of responsibility, right, when we're paying our taxes. Whether we like it or not, it's our responsibility. And to approach it with that attitude makes it different. Finally, number four, do something about your stress. So if you're under stress, we've identified our warning signs so we know when we're stressed. We've looked at what it is that stresses us out, whether it's family or Houston traffic or whatever. And we've looked at the fact that we, ha we, can't, we have to focus on what we can change and not on what we can't change. And finally, taking action then. So what I would suggest is that if your warning sign of stress is physical, like I mentioned, I, get, I grind my teeth at night, um, then I want to do something physically active to relax. So oftentimes when I'm stressed, I love to walk my dog and just spend time walking and letting, doing something physical that allows me to, to uh, relieve that energy. If your stress, if your warning sign of stress is emotional or behavioral, then you might want to do something mentally relaxing. What's something that's mentally relaxing for you? Could be listening to music, could be reading a good book, long baths, I love that, uh, massages, yeah, I'm going to that hospital. <laughs> I've been to Parkland, actually, um, and I love massages, too, and, you know, Sometimes we have, as I mentioned, I can be irritable when I'm stressed as well, as, as well as having physical symptoms, so I can have both. And when I have both, I want to do something that's both active and relaxes my mind. And so something like that could be yoga, where you're actually focusing your mind as well as uh, exercising your body. Uh, massages can actually be both. It'd be good for when you have both. 
signs of stress. More often than not, it can start with stress. I would say for most people, it's both. Um, but whatever whatever sign gets your attention is usually not your first sign of stress, but it's the sign that says to me, hey, I better do something about this, right? Uh, and it's often personal. So I love to play golf, but for some people, golf is a very frustrating game. And so they don't go to, they don't go to play golf to relax. They go to play golf to associate with friends or do business or whatever. But I associate golf with relaxing. Barriers to taking action. Uh, first of all, I can't think of what to do. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is a brainstorming of what are some of the things that you do when you're stressed that relax you. Um, we've heard the massages, long baths, reading books, music, all of that kind of thing. But the second barrier is choosing a difficult activity. Uh, I know that a lot of us at, um, and at the new year make resolutions maybe to exercise. Anybody ever done that? To, to exercise? And, and then we think that we have to go every day to the gym. And so we choose an activity that's too difficult for us. Uh, and so it becomes overwhelming. And finally, postponing stress reduction. Oh, I'll do that tomorrow. Uh, I'll relax next week. I'll get that massage next month. One of the things that we teach in Powerful Tools for Caregivers is an action plan in our care caregivers that come to this workshop uh, do this every week and the action plan is very specific it's something you want to do it's something that's reachable in other words you'll know that you can when you've done it it's something that's behavior specific so it's not oh I'll relax for five minutes this week it's I'm going to take a walk for five minutes this week to relax so it's behavior specific and it answers these questions what am I going to do how much when and how often and that way I can actually measure my success. And then finally, the confidence level of how, I'm, how successful I think I'll be from 1 to 10. Uh, and usually we don't let anybody go below a 6 on that. If you're trying to do something and you only have a confidence level of 2, then we encourage you to do something uh, less demanding or less time uh, consuming so that you can actually get it done and be successful at it. And that's the whole purpose of taking action to reduce stress is that you're successful. Some tools for a positive attitude. First of all, to view setbacks as temporary. Everybody hates me. Has anybody ever heard that before? Uh, that, that's a universal. You know, well, so and so doesn't like me, but that's okay. You know, that's specific and it's temporary. I did something that upset them today. View misfortunes as specific and not universal. Seek solutions to problems, view mistakes as opportunities, give yourself credit, recognize that beliefs are not facts, and I think this is very important, beliefs are not facts, and practice positive self-talk. It's like the little engine that could, right? Going up the hill, I think I can. Whoops. Go back one here. This symbol is uh, referred to as a mandorla, and it comes from the Italian mandala, which means almond. And you'll see that in the center of this picture is an almond shaped uh, symbol, and this symbol has been used over the centuries as a symbol for spiritual connection and, uh, and for spirituality. And I want to suggest to you uh, that spirituality is about our connectedness in life. So when we think of spirituality, we often jump to religion uh, and beliefs. But I want to suggest to you that our spiritual lives are really about how we're connected to each other and to the whole of life. And when something disrupts that connection, it can be very threatening and difficult for us to deal with. In addition to that, however, it can become a powerful ally when we are trying to do something that's difficult. Whoops. I'll get, I'll get it going here. <laughs> so some definitions of spirituality. Uh, I love the second one there, Dr. Dyer. Connection to intention. Uh, listening to your heart and conducting yourself based on what your inner voice tells you is your purpose here. 
And then finally, Thomas More, the spirit is that transcending element in anyone aspiring to be a better, to, to a better life, greater understanding, or more inspiring vision. Uh, Eckhart Tolle in that the first one, state of connectedness. Spirituality is the state of connectedness. And what we do to get in touch with our spiritual side is what I would refer to as a ritual. And rituals are very important. They're carefully designed sets of behavior that speak directly to our subconscious mind. Think about that. In ritual, we create a time and place that is sacred and safe. And the point of ritual is preparation. And rituals allow the transition from everyday life into that sacred space to happen smoothly and easily. They're tools we use to connect our spiritual life with the mundane impact of our world. And entering into ritual awakens us to what is eternal within ourselves as well as the world around us. Here's some examples of rituals. Uh, these are things that we might be doing every day. For instance, shaking hands is a ritual. Uh, meditation, of course, chanting and singing, prayer. Holiday traditions are rituals. Uh, turkey on Thanksgiving Day is a ritual, and it connects us with the purpose of what? Being thankful, being grateful for the blessings that we have in life. Birthday cake and candles. Have you ever thought of birthday cake and candles as a ritual? Uh, I asked I asked a group one time, what, it, what does birthday cake and candles connect us to? And this, this lady said, ice cream. <laughs> Uh, but they do. I mean, we use those to, to celebrate life, right? Journaling, fasting, silence. And the reason this is important is because I want to suggest that we can develop rituals that when we are stressed and dealing with difficult challenges as caregivers, these rituals can be used to connect us to our purpose. When I was a young minister, uh, I used to pass out when I went into hospital rooms, and I had to visit patients quite a bit. So when I would go to the hospital, my blood pressure would start going up immediately when I got in the car. And I, it became a real problem, and I hated it when I would go into a patient's room and pass out. So I finally, I, did, I passed out a lot in my life. I finally went to a therapist, a friend of mine, who had been a chaplain at, in the burn unit at the Children's Hospital in Dallas. And I said, tell me what you did to prepare yourself to be in that environment. And he said, before I went into the room, I would remind myself, I'm here to help. I'm here to help. It became my mantra. Exactly. And I started saying that before I went into hospital rooms. And, and it really helped me. It became my ritual. Uh, so I want us to think about rituals that we might can develop for ourselves as family caregivers or as professional caregivers to help us connect to that sense of purpose that we have when we are challenged something that we can go to and prepare ourselves for in the midst of these challenges to be the best that we can be. Now, what is it for you that connects you to the sense of divine or spirit of the holy in your life? Uh, what is it that you do that connects you to life yourself? Is there something that you and your family do together that connects you to your sense of family? Uh, it used to be that everybody used to sit around the dinner table together. That became a ritual that we did. Most of us don't do that anymore. So how do we get connected as family? Uh, and what about with my coworkers? How can I connect myself with my coworkers? Who am I for those people that I work with? And what can I do to help myself be aware of that when I'm in their presence? And to my care receiver, who am I for the people that I care for? Um, one of my mantras is, uh, I am someone who makes a difference. And I look for an opportunity to make a difference, no matter how small, when I'm with someone. And I don't feel successful unless I feel like I've done something that's made a difference. I can't, I'm not always aware that I've made a difference. 
and most of us as caregivers, uh, that's one of the challenges that we deal with is that we do things that are hoping or making a difference, but we're not always aware of it. We don't always see it. Uh, so sometimes it's just something that we have to choose uh, for ourselves to know. And that is that what I'm doing, I know, makes a difference. Uh, but what can I do to connect me with that sense uh, of purpose? Um, think about that for yourself. That's all I have. But I think, you know, I think to review, um, we all have challenges that we deal with as caregivers, professional and family. Uh, we all have uh, sense of losses that we experience in our roles as caregivers. And we all have stress that we have to deal with. And so really what I hope you'll do is take the opportunity to think from the spiritual sense what I can do that continues to connect me with my purpose uh, even when I'm feeling challenged or stressed or grieving. So I hope that's been helpful. If anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and ask them. You can unmute your phone or you can type it in. Um, anyone in here have questions? Yeah, so can you go back when you uh -huh. were making the list of, um, was, it's only about 12, 12 or 15 slides back. It's kind of in the middle. You were making a list of, um, I wondered if they were, Compiled that in an order, in a certain order, or if that's how you do Talking it. about the challenges? I think so. Um, that. Okay. Yeah, maybe. That was it. Yeah, and the challenges? It, 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 was that, I mean, is that in any order? Is that, um, I don't know. It just kind of jumped at me that, you know. It was not in any order. Um, that would have put anger and frustration further up in, yeah. in what, yeah. Yeah, it's not a hierarchical okay. order um, in terms, when I was thinking about when I compiled this list, this is my list, uh, were some of the challenges that I've heard caregivers express the most. Okay, so it's just, uh, it's so professional caregivers, so it was more random, okay. And they came to me as I was thinking about them, and as they came to me, I put them down. Yeah. But it, would, it might be interesting to think about how would I uh, arrange this list in a hierarchical fashion, and what does that mean for me in terms of what I have to be aware of when I'm in a, in a challenging situation. Um, but I, I feel like a lot of the folks that I've worked with, uh, the sense of attachment has been one of the things that has been the hardest to identify and it creeps up on you and then when you have that loss uh, you grieve and you wonder why do I feel so badly here why do I feel such a sense of loss here and uh, that sense of attachment becomes very important so is anybody have a question is that what you're going to say sure go ahead so just I, I think it's interesting um, working with patients uh, and Kind of over the long haul of my journey of interface with patients and caregivers and the, the comment that after a loved one passes and mm -hmm. and they will say to me i'm so upset that nobody from my medical team came wow and, or, or or from my my wife's medical team or who, whoever mm -hmm. it was and i've I have a very good relationship with my medical oncologist, and, and he and I have actually shown up together, not together, but at, at the same funeral for mm -hmm. a couple of his patients that I got to know through what I do. But I know he doesn't go to everybody's. Right. Um, how, and, and I think there's a, a real need to not get, have to show, you know, that there's that right. attachment, but that you also be, have to be detached. Yeah. And you want to say to the family, um, and I think it's a very special cases where the medical. Well, and it's, attachment happens both ways. Okay, mm -hmm. attachment happens from the patient's perspective as well as from the care caregiver's perspective. And so, what that patient is op 
obviously expressing is a sense of attachment uh, and to the physician as a care and probably a family caregiver right. uh, instead of the patient right 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 uh, mm -hmm. and and perhaps an unrealistic expectation based exactly. on that sense of attachment uh, of what they would hope would have happened by their care team you know their medical team and of course we all recognize that uh, you know I'm not the only patient right or I'm not my, my loved one isn't the only patient that physician is or the, that uh, medical staff is caring for a number of people. However, it, it is interesting, and I forget where I saw this, you know, would it be appropriate, and it might almost seem contrived, but where there's a loss of a patient that the medical team is, realizes that and a handwritten note goes out to the family. Absolutely, and, and there are clinics that actually have a protocol for that. For that. And uh, I think it's important for clinics, especially oncology clinics or clinics dealing with the types of life-threatening diseases, uh, to look at that. It's, it's just, I, I think it has to be uh, tempered with the reality of the situation and, and that whole, and, what, and the commitment of that clinic, uh, you know. And, you know. So it might help relieve some of that stress that right. those nurses are feeling right. that there was if you uh, do this, yeah, uh, you can write that note. A ritual, even. A ritual. A ritual that you have in the clinic for uh, embracing that loss, that sense of loss. I mean, we struggle with that at CanCare when we lose clients and when we lose volunteers. What is the appropriate response for us? We have 700 volunteers. And we have uh, over 3,000 active clients right now. So, I mean, how do we manage all of that because we don't often hear about the deaths right. until months after they've occurred uh, and we do our best to respond but, but you know how do you do that uh, and, it, and it also impacts us and you know there are volunteers that we're more connected to than others there are clients that we become connected to and attached to and so you know again it's all about our sense of attachment and nurturing that and being aware of our sense of loss with that that's, that's all we really have time for anyway. So if anybody has any other questions, you can just e email them along. Um, so thank you so much for presenting. Sorry for I was here. late. Yes. Oh, it's okay. We understand. And um, thanks, everybody, for listening in. And I also want to thank the uh, program committee for who put these together. Um, They're online right now. So Laura Pena, Lizette Martinez, and Gina Lawson, thank you so much for being on our committee. And it's chaired by Julie Nangia this year. Um, who can listen in today. Uh, so thank you to them. And again, this will be up on our YouTube, uh, which is youtube.com slash Breast Health Texas. So um, thanks for listening in, everybody. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.